Ashava, it is lovely to see you, um, not live in person, but on a screen. And congratulations on your new album, which was out only a week ago now. Uh, 12, so a couple of weeks ago oh. now. <laughs> I've lost track. I've been listening to it um, for a while, so I should know that. But it's it's a, I don't want to say it's a great achievement because that sounds like it's an ex, it's ex, something extraordinary from what you normally do. But it's it's a really wonderful album, really heartfelt, emotional, um, insightful, and musically great. Very Thank important. you so much. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about your background, actually, as an artist. And your first stage performance was at the age of five. Slimming a, singing a slim dusty song do you remember how you felt when you did that no not how I felt um I remember a lot of relatives standing like at, at in the front of the stage telling me what name to say next oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I was singing Duncan <laughs> um and I think yeah a bit overwhelmed maybe and yeah <laughs> uh, so did you get it all correct when they were prompting you? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's part of the course. Uh, was Slim Dusty regular listening in your home when you were growing up? Yeah, yeah. Um, my grandparents, especially my pop, he's a, a huge um, Slim Dusty fan. So um, Slim Dusty was always playing. And, you know, when we'd go away on holidays, it'd be a Slim Dusty cassette in the, in the tape player. And, yeah, he was always on. <laughs> so were you the sort of child who liked to sing along in the car if you were traveling um not so much oh yeah sometimes um <laughs> I just sang along whenever really <laughs> so who else were you listening to as you grew up um a lot of Loretta Lynn Tammy Wynette um Susie Quattro was in there um yeah, a lot. Yeah, Charlie Pride, Lynn Anderson. Um, my grandparents were are uh, massive um, country music fans, so I, I got to listen to a lot of great, um, great artists growing up. Yeah, if you were if you were listening to Tammy and Loretta when you were quite young, that must have been um, somewhat of an education, I would think. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. And at what age did you decide that music was something that you wanted to pursue seriously? Around age 14. Mm -hmm. um, that was the age that I, I first picked up a guitar um, and decided that that was it. I was going to write my own songs and, um, and sing them, like perform them. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been playing piano for a few years, you know, since I was a kid, but I never took that too seriously. Um, and yeah, so round 14, when I first picked up that guitar, that was, that was the end of it for me. That was, um, yeah, I'd, I'd sold my soul then. <laughs> <laughs> so in saying that you didn't take piano too seriously, obviously there was something about guitar as an instrument that, that resonated with you. Was it that ability to play and sing at the same time? That's which, you know, on piano can be a little complicated. Yeah. And I think I wasn't, um, on piano, I, I didn't learn you know, a style of music that I liked. Like I was sort of just learning whatever was put in front of me. And whereas guitar, you know, I when I first learnt my first chord, I'd already picked out a, a song that I wanted to learn. I can't actually remember what it was, but I'd picked out a song and it was like a four chord song. And I'm like, if I learn to play all four of those chords, then I know a song. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, you know, like I had a bit more um, incentive to, to learn the guitar and then I could sing along to it and yeah and from there because it's quite it's one thing to cover other people's songs on guitar and learn you know it's it's I think it's really instructive to learn how other songs are put together but it's a it is another leap to start writing your own song so at what stage did you think yes I'm doing this oh, about the same time um <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's all, it all, it all, it all, it all, it was like all at once. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I I remember I was I was like the first week of school and I was homesick and my dad got this brand new guitar and he brought me brought it around to show me um, and I had no interest before this point to play guitar. I'd sort of really you know. I just, because he was, you know, pressuring me so much to learn guitar, I was like, no, nope, I was being stubborn. But I, he brought this guitar around and I, I seen it and was like, I want to play that. 
And as soon as I started learning a few chords, just the whole, you know, I was learning to play other people's songs, but I struggled a little bit with that. So I just started playing my own stuff and, you know, m messing around with chord um, progressions and, and all of that fun stuff. And the writing just sort of come from there. <laughs> yeah, right. So did you leave piano completely in the dust at that time? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's still in the dust. <laughs> I'm sure the piano would like to think that it might have helped you along your path to to play <laughs> and, and writing songs on guitar. It did. It it actually did. You know, learning um, you know, learning how to read music at a young age and um, learning the scales and all of that stuff on the piano that definitely has has helped. So yeah. I can't you know can't completely write off the piano. <laughs> It's a, it's a good solid instrument. Um, now your first album was in 2013. So were you, are you a, a songwriter who likes to write for a project or do you tend to collect songs as you go? So for that album, when did you start writing the songs? Um, for that album, that was a really collect as I go album. Um, I, I started writing those songs when I was 18. So I, I wrote them between 18 and about 23. Um, and I recorded that when I was 24. Um, so that was just, yeah, a collection of songs that I had there and they all sort of got put on an album. And yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very proud of that first album, but um, yeah, it's, it's been a long time since I've done that. <laughs> True, but like 23, 24, it's, it's quite something to, to put that together because it's not, yeah, putting together an album, it's its a whole piece of work in so many respects. It's not just, oh, let's grab these songs from here to there. It's thinking about putting it together. It's like writing a novel in a lot of ways. Yeah. So at that age, did you just feel that you, you had things you wanted to say and it was the right time to put them on an album? Yeah, there's a lot of, um, on that album, you know, there's, I wrote, like I spent, one of the most popular songs off that album is called I'd Rather Be Drunk and it's a, um <laughs> but it's it's like a love song gone wrong um but you know when I wrote that I didn't really understand it um I didn't you know I wrote it and then I put it away for a few years because I I was just didn't know what it meant for me you know um and then you know it's not till these later years where I've gone oh that's what that means like I like that song now yeah right <laughs> um so yeah, there was a, a few of those on that album. So um, I think it was a good collection of songs for where I was um, at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but it definitely, you know, there's a lot of song. There's a few songs on there about my childhood, um, mm -hmm. which I think was the perfect time for me to tell those stories. I think that, you know, that was, it's done now. It's, I was, you know, early adulthood and, um Oh, your videos. Yeah. Are <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> um, and sorry, you mentioned, that's all right. You mentioning that song, um, I'd rather be drunk, makes me think of a song on your new album, which is cheap champagne. And the, the line is <laughs> loving you is like drinking cheap champagne. And when I first heard it, I thought, that is gold. So <laughs> how did you come up with that line? Well, I had the song title Cheap Champagne on my phone, I reckon for about two years. Um, and I was, I was home one day, I was sitting on the lounge and just, I was going through my song titles and then this line just come to me, loving you is like drinking cheap champagne. And I was like, that's it. Yeah. That's, that's that song. Like I, cause I had up to that point, I had no idea what I was going to write about cheap champagne. Like, how do you, <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> I just knew I wanted to write a song called cheap champagne. Um, yeah, so I wrote that whole song and around that one line, um, but I just knew it had to be a cold, hard, drinking, cheating country song. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm so proud of how that song turned out. Oh, it's, yeah, it's terrific. Um, and also, I mean, it's also a statement of, of, I think, valuing yourself in a relationship in that, you know, no one really wants to drink cheap champagne unless they have to. So don't, you know, don't be in a love affair that's that is like that yeah absolutely yeah okay. um as a singer you have this uh real immediacy and warmth to your voice which is like you know we're standing across from you in a recording studio except that I wonder when you sing 
from that place is re the recording process frustrating you know multiple takes stopping and starting that sort of thing or do you enjoy it um most mostly I enjoy it right. um <laughs> there are a few songs that you know the the more heavier songs the more personal the song is um you know tapping back into that emotion is can get quite difficult um to you know sing it again and again and again in the studio um and you know feel those emotions over and over and over again you know um when you've already felt them mm -hmm. to start yeah. with to be able to write the song um but then yeah to have to relive it over again in the studio and try not to become immune to those feelings I, like you know if I sing something over and over again I'm that's how I get immune to songs like I have to sit there the the you know the sing you back home song on my album I wrote that the day after my mum died mm -hmm. um and I couldn't get through it without crying for like a long time but I just had to keep, I sat there and I sang it over and over and over again to get myself immune to it. So getting back in the studio and tapping back into that emotion, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it can be quite difficult. And then in performance as well, particularly with a song like that, and there is, there's a lot of heavy emotion on this album. Um, I would imagine at a certain point, I guess, in performance, the song starts to belong to the audience, not to you. And maybe that's how you can sing it over and over again. Yeah, yeah, I've sang, um, you know, like Sing You Back Home quite a bit um, on, like, in Alive, and it's it's quite difficult, you know, when you're sort of, you're trying to connect with the audience, but then they start crying, and <laughs> you're trying to, like, I've sort of just got to look over their heads and <laughs> try yeah. not to look at them, because, um, yeah, I would never make it through the song if I, I look at someone and they're crying. <laughs> Yeah, I, I completely understand. I mean, it's, I think it is hard enough even talking about things like that, let alone singing, singing about them to um, strangers or stranger friends as they'll become when they're yeah. your audience. So as, as we talked about, you released your first album in 2013 and you attended the CMAA Academy of Country Music in 2016. So yeah. was that, was there a lull in your musical life between those two things or just, it, you know, obviously getting the time to go to the Academy you need to arrange things in your life was it just that's when the time happened that was just the right time I think um the academy was something that I wanted to do for a lot of years um and just 2015 just felt like the right time to apply for that um and yeah to go in 2016 and it just it just all worked really it just it wasn't an intentional thing it was just the right time mm -hmm. and what was that oh, look everyone who goes to the academy seems to love it so I'm going to presume you had a great time but is there something in particular that you didn't expect to learn that you found out when you got there um oh look all of it um <laughs> it, was just, <laughs> it was I don't really know what I was expecting um but I wasn't expecting it to be one of the best two weeks of my life um and, you know, still to this day, it is one of the best experiences I've ever had to, you know, I'm from Broken Hill. So I'm sitting out here by myself at my kitchen table, writing my, my songs. Um, and I've never really known other songwriters. So to be able to go to something like that and be surrounded by such like-minded people mm. um, was just an absolute amazing experience. Have you since found some like-minded people in Broken Hill? A couple, um, <laughs> not many. <laughs> well, look, it's not, a, it's not a huge population, so that makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah, a couple. There are there are a couple of songwriters out here, so it's nice. But um, we're we're very different genres, so it's it's not a, a co-write type situation. I'm I'm still sitting at my kitchen table writing by myself. <laughs> Have you ever done any co-writes? Yes, there's um, a couple of co-writes on this new album. Mm -hmm. um, so. Backwards Town and Shoot to Kill, I wrote with Bill Chambers and Rain, I wrote with Kevin Bennett. Very esteemed um, co-writers. Do you enjoy <laughs> the co-writing process? I have. I have the little that I've done of it. Um, it, it was a bit daunting to start with, uh, you know, being in front of someone and then having to sort of put your thoughts to them about a song. Um, but I think the more comfortable you are with the people 
the better it's going to go obviously so those two I felt I felt really comfortable with so it was it was pretty easy yeah and and Bill um I would imagine you feel comfortable with because you've had quite a long association with him so he produced your 2013 album he also produced Backwards Town and Nash Chambers um it recorded it in Nashville um what is it about these Chambers blokes that <laughs> works to you as a musician um yeah Bill has just been in my corner since 2013 when I met him um and yeah he's you know, he supported me since then and um, I really gel with him musically. Um, we're sort of on the same page of, you know, what I want and I'm not scared to tell him what I want and if I don't like something, you know, we, we sort of have that relationship where it's, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable to go, no, nah, no, nah, scrap it, don't like that. Um, yeah, so, and, and Nash, you know, I had the... Bill sort of put the Nashville thing to me when we were discussing recording another album and yeah I can't pass up any country artist I don't think would be able to pass up an opportunity to go to Nashville. <laughs> True and you had some great musicians working on it as well um, over yeah. there and sounds like there, there might, was, were there any, was there any tracks recorded here because it was Jed, Jed Hughes and Lucky Oceans or were they in Nashville? No it was all over in Nashville. Oh, fun. Yeah. Well, fun yeah. out of work, obviously. Because <laughs> um, it is, yeah, I, from my impression, I haven't been, but it's it sounds like it's it's a productive place to be if you are recording because things just tick along. You've got to get the work done in the studio, out of the studio. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was, um, yeah, it was a really good few days. We sort of just got the tracks down and, but it was, um, yeah, it was so much fun. And you mentioned uh, that you will say to Bill, no, I don't want that or I don't like that. Would you consider producing your, your own work at some stage, as in without um, anyone else there? Maybe one day, probably not, not quite yet. Um, but, yeah, definitely one day. I would love to sort of have that to my name. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, I, I think... More women should enter the field as producers. Uh, Catherine Britt's been doing a lot of it lately, which is fantastic. Um, so in this album, or on this album, I should say, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of you in there, and you can, we can hear it in your voice, but also in the lyrics, there's a lot that's really revealing of your mind and your emotions. Um, I mean, obviously, as a songwriter, you want to draw on your experiences and be authentic. But it, have you ever had any hesitation about revealing? A lot of yourself in your songs knowing that it goes out into the world yes um not when I'm writing but definitely after the fact and when you're looking for songs to record um you, you know like the the hardest parts was was one of them and um mercy was another one you sort of sit back and go oh do I want to put that out there do I want people to know that about me um you know, or about my relationship, about my life. But, you know, if you can't say your truth, if you can't sing your truth, if you can't put that out there, I, I just don't see the point. So I, yeah, it's, it's, I think I'm very blessed that I can do that and I have the ability to do that. So it's a commitment though, isn't it? Because I'm sure there are times when you're, when you're starting to to record something, maybe we think, oh, I don't know. So, and, and at that point, it's, it's kind of, recommitting yourself to what you started when you wrote that song yes absolutely um and it comes back to you know that that emotion that you feel that sort of makes you write that song um that drives you to the point of writing that song and then you're feeling it all over again recording it and singing it live it's it can be quite overwhelming and quite daunting but um I think that that's that's one of the most special things about being a songwriter and being able to um, share your experiences and your life with people. Yeah. And presumably also getting feedback from time to time from the audience that something that you've created resonates with them and maybe helps them through whatever experience they're having. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, you know, I've, I've been at shows and I've, I've sang one of those songs and I think it was, sing you back home once and you know this lady come up to me and she was just howling and she's just wrapped her arms around me and hugged me and 
it was, you know, it's those sorts of moments that just make it all worthwhile that, you know, you lose all the doubt and you just go, yep, I've done the right thing. Yeah. Do you ever have times either when you're writing or recording or performing, any of them, where you think, oh, I don't know who this song is for right now, but it's for someone. And then something like that happens. You think, okay, it was for that person. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a few songs that I write that I don't, I don't understand. I don't know what they're about or who they're about. Um, and I generally sort of write them and then I'll put them away. I won't sort of sing them if I, I don't get it because I can't, you know, relate to them enough, I guess. Um, yeah, and then something will happen and I'll go, that song, that's what that's about. And then, yeah, and then I'll relate to it. So I'll pull it back out and I'll be able to put the emotion in it that it deserves, I guess. So I, I start singing it again. <laughs> So I guess it's a, that's trusting, well, in a way, it's it's a letting yourself be open to whatever creative impulse is coming through to an extent, knowing that it's not necessarily out of your brain or out of your ego or whatever it is. It's like this is an idea that's come to you. It's your job to document it. And then at the right time, you pass it on. Yeah, definitely. There's, um, especially like for me, um, uh, you know, an emotional just grab hold of me and I'll just, or, you know, lyrics will just come to me and I just have to write that song. Like it's, it doesn't even feel like a choice. It's, I just have to get it down. Um, and then I'll sort of sit back and go, what, what am I writing this about? Like, what is this? I don't understand what's going on here, but um, yeah, then, you know, a couple months, a couple of years down the track, something will happen and yeah. Yeah. Well, one of my favourite songs on the album is I Choose Me, which is the song <laughs> title, because um, it's 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 a statement that is at odds with a lot of cultural conditioning, basically, which is, you know, this is a story of a relationship and you're saying, you know, I'll have your baby, I'll look after you, I'll fight in your corner. But if it comes down to a choice between you and me, I'm choosing me. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering when you made the first determination to choose you in a situation. Um probably around the time when I wrote that song I think. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> it was a mission statement then <laughs> it was um yeah that that's one of those um songs that was talking about before that you're like oh do I want people to know that about me um you know because that is that is a true story that is based on my own relationship and my own experiences so yeah it's a that one's a very personal song it's great. I think it should be an anthem <laughs> for a lot of people, actually. Um, and we, you mentioned earlier um, writing a song the day after your mother died and performing that song. And there is a bit of grief, either explicitly or tacitly, on this album. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, if you find it, if does writing actually help you through grief, or um, are there times when? you found that, that grief actually can block you from expressing what you want to do and then you have to find another way to bring it out? No, in the past grief, um, writing has really helped um, with the grief process. Um, I might not write it, you know, right then and there when I'm feeling, you know, the, the big emotions and, the, you know, when I'm right in the middle of the, the grief period. Um, but... I process it and then I'll write about it and then it's sort of you know I've, I'm just getting there and then I'll write about it and then it's like okay I can move on now right. like I'm I'm to the point I'm not sad that sad anymore I can just let it let it sit there now I can let it go and sort of move forward. Yeah, well, it seems a, a quite healthy way of dealing with grief, actually. There are plenty of other ways that are not <laughs> as healthy, but that's like a process of managing it and you and you do have a defined process. I'm writing this song, then I may record this song and then I may perform this song and all this is a way of progressing through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of cheap champagne in the middle, <laughs> but... <laughs> oh, wrong with that. <laughs> Um, and you said, I was reading that you said that music makes you feel hopeful and not so alone. And I was wondering if there are particular artists or songs that you turn to when you need solace it's, or a reminder that you're not alone. Yeah, um, definitely, you know, like in the last few years, Laurie McKenna is a huge one. Um, I always 
go back to her songs, I think, because she's, you know, so real and, um, you know, talks about real life stuff in her songs. Um, Casey Chambers was a huge influence growing up. Um, and, you know, Brandy Carlisle. I just love all their, all that sort of music, you know, that talks about real stuff. Yeah. Well, they are all artists who come from a very authentic place, yes. And also I think, um, you know, have probably had their own hesitations about revealing things and push through them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I have to say, like, it's, it's a nice feeling when you get to that point, when you push through that self-doubt and, um, and get to the other side it's and you know then to release it and have other people feed back to you you know it's it makes it worthwhile yeah well of course over the past couple of years uh there hasn't been a lot of um in-person feedback because shows have not been possible and even in Broken Hill you had to be locked down um probably thanks to Sydney Sliders um as well so have you found it harder to connect with your audience or have you made use of of the online environment to stay connected um no i've done a, a, a especially last year um i've done a fair few lives on facebook and um kept connected that way and i yeah i i got really used to actually doing the the live facebook stuff it was a bit weird to start with but um you, you get used to it pretty quickly um but yeah definitely looking forward to getting back to real life people <laughs> um one artist i spoke to said that she learned that it's not a good idea to check the comments on the lives as you're playing because you can't actually do both because it's too distracting to look at comments coming up on the screen yes yes i've i've started reading a few comments singing a song and then forgot all the words to the yeah. song so <laughs> i had to stop that too <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's there is multitasking, but that's I think asking too much of an artist. Um, so my last question, I will ask you now that things are opening up again. What are your plans for twenty twenty two? Oh, I'm hoping to be able to get out and do a few shows next year. Um, just sort of still playing it by year because it's you know we've got this new strain now, so I don't know what's going to happen there. But um, yeah, definitely that's the plan to to get out and um, get this album out and um be able to sing it to everybody uh so do you pack the car and drive from broken hill or do you tend to fly when you can depends where we're going <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i've had a i had a gig a few years ago on the not on the central coast it was about two hours away from the central coast and we drove three hours to an airport got on a plane got that plane to melbourne changed planes got another plane to sydney then hired a car, then drove to the Central Coast, <laughs> stayed at the Central Coast tonight, and then drove the extra two and a half hours the next day to the gig. So that's, it's, um, it can be a logistical nightmare getting to gigs from here, but it's yeah. doable. I was just thinking in the end, it might've been faster just to drive from Broken Hill, but <laughs> probably a little more stressful because it's a long, it is a long drive. Yeah. Uh, well, Shana, congratulations again on the album. Um, it's it's a wonderful piece of work, uh, a wonderful collection of songs, but also the individual songs are so strong. So um, thank you for producing something beautiful and meaningful. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you do get back on the road in 2022. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Lovely to see you on screen. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.